Parece bom. Chega um pouquinho mais pro lado, pra ficar um quadrado. Mais. Mais pro lado. Hum? Não, mais pro lado. Pra cá? É. Eu não tenho mais nenhuma aqui, que longe. Vira, vira, vira mais. Hum, tá Esse aqui não fica tão passado assim, ó. Vou enquadrar mais os dois. Pronto. Deixa eu passar esse um pra lá. Esse aqui pra lá. Esse aqui pra próximo. Isso aqui? Agora sim. Yes, you are online through all. Tá um pouco torto, não tá? Is it streaming and the recording at the same time? It's, it's streaming and it's going to be saved on my web channel, my website, oh. on my YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Ruiz said that two uh, lines story is going to be separated by two before YouTube. After YouTube, it's true. Caralho, viva o Watch. Ó, deixa eu ver se mexer. É porque é outro. Não, tô todo mundo usado. Ah, é. A gente trocou o link. Hum. I'm looking for the Skype. Yeah. <coughs> you can just do the Skype and that should be good. <coughs> I'm wondering if you spend too much time with the Skype. Thank you. Okay, I'll just send you. Send me, should I just send to you? Hey. Hello, hello. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah, I know you found some Wait, Thank you. 
You have a WhatsApp, right? Yeah. Well, both of you. Oh. Oh, yeah, right? So, you send me the email. I did not know. I don't think I was going to do yesterday. Hey, you too. Hey, man. 
Setting up this really high tech stand. Almost. I had a green and Marty wanted to push it back. Fair enough. I mean, I'm going to cut right now. No, no. Took some time. Yeah, that's what counts. Everything else is good. Tá bom, tá bom.
Be careful as you're getting here. Okay, yeah. So there's there's five people watching. There's five people watching me and there's a lot of artifacts in the and he thinks it'd be nice for me to go through and explain what all the artifacts are. I don't have enough time to track down what each one of those things is. It sounds difficult. The more I can capture it, better. And it's still up to the one that we observe ideal regeneration, which I haven't seen. Well, one of the pieces of the world is like the basic world. Maybe, I mean, maybe, but, but that can't be true because I do see some kind of chatter <laughs> in my term, but it might not be that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the uh, awesome. reason. Can you cause chatter? Yeah. yeah. That's the oh, thing. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not yeah. happening because, either because of my experimental conditions or just because of the way my machine set up. It doesn't check. You gotta take both. I just, what I, what I think we're observing is just force vibration due to friction. So friction is still consistent yeah. with the friction, but it's not resonant. It's, it's just being the yeah. so force vibration is only seeing the friction on that force vibration. <coughs> so that's is it the same line of force vibration the microphone is seeing, or is it the No. So they see actually broadband and they're just basically the same sensor. Hmm. So there's something. Mm -hmm. It could just be that they're very unpredictable. Well, that's one of the things I tested, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but once it's like you're not sure you're not looking for the right location, I don't know. I mean, one possibility might be they use bad tools and use steel. They have less friction and steel, so you should have bad tools. And I almost have them, but they didn't get one. So we can get one bad tool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to cut under water. Let's see if that changes the way you can add it. Oh, there's a lot of things. No, I don't know. There's a lot of water. I need a little bit of water. John sent this. Water because it's not a lot of water. Oh, yeah. It's hard to make it. Yeah, it's hard to make it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't it. I don't know if you want to do it. I do it. I do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't know if you want to do it. I don't the only round is zero from the back. Oh, just to be like, it's easy to go on. I'm getting that thought about it. What a very good. Four bucks a day. Bring your coffee there, right? Maybe not today, but Monday, anyway. There's still something to make for us. Yeah, they have a ton of milk kits. No, I think it's bad for the IPA. Yeah, and the med kit. Yeah, like the Let's uh, 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 like, turn down the light there so we can see something. Yeah. I don't know. Because it's lighter now, it's blank on the transmission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's too blank. I think so. Like it's too blank, but you can see that. Oh, washed out. Um, <laughs> and it's maybe for Scott's the same. Wait, if you make it darker, it's worse, right? Things are really so crazy. You should be brighter to make it You could just have like this. Like with the light time, just see the MIT. Can you start? Or can you work? You can see the slide. You get darker, we'll make it, and then you can see the slide. Our book might be super bright. Maybe just have a photo photo iris. So you could point the bright side to make it darker. Oh, yeah, it's a little better. Yeah, it's okay. I think maybe the light bulb is the better video, probably. I don't, I don't think the light bothers too much. Can you turn on this red light right here? Just that one? Just the front light? Yeah, that might help because it's already bright. Yeah. Oh, not that one. Oh, no, no, no. We'll need the screen side. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's it. You got it. That's it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, there's another light over there. <laughs> it might be from the. Uh, <laughs> so complex. Okay. Maybe okay. use the scale. I think that's maybe, the best maybe, maybe, maybe it's less. Yeah. Less stay like this. Yeah. That's it, doing it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yeah. They got worse. <laughs> I think there's like complex control. Right? Uh, let's 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 just start like. This. All right. I think uh, let's let's get begin. Thank thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, I, I have a very special feeling. Uh, the Arbors, you know, we've been together for a long time and uh, been together with many different projects. Like Chira, first Chira did together, and Clay, and all that picture, and like uh, this big project, a Burmese project. It's not going to talk too much about. It. It's just take on different uh, topics. And like he, you know, we went through a lot of things together, and uh, one of the big trip uh, we prepared with the Hermes demo, he literally planned everything, and uh, so uh, it's really excited. And then pleased to introduce Arbor. I just want to say uh, two things about uh, Arbor. First thing is that he's such a nice guy, helping so many people, using his wide range of knowledge. So you'll see a lot of like uh, his paper, his name is showing on many many different papers and range of things. And uh, second thing is his audacity to really tackle this really big picture problem, this big question, uh, not like rarely people tackle on, and he followed through with the persistency of the, the intelligence. I really appreciate every time he present his work in our group meeting, it took like an hour to just discuss every single time. Like so whenever he present, we prepare like two hour, two and a half hour room meeting for renovation. It's going to be a lot, long discussion and every time we, we scratch our head, try to understand the concept. So I think he did a really good job uh, making it easier to explain today. So uh, uh, I think uh, I, I think it's going to definitely shed some interesting light on this uh, risk analysis. And uh, without uh, further ado, I will uh, let our work uh, start. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, to, today my talk will be uh, methodology to quantify the risk of failure for dynamic robots. So in the first part of my PhD, uh, I started with building uh, the Hermes robot. And this was a really great learning experience. I uh, learned all about hardware failures and integration and all that. And uh, what we were trying to do in this concept uh, was leverage the human intelligence, your athletic intelligence, and use it to give more capabilities uh, to the robot. So it was a teleoperated system. So you can see in the video here, uh, that's Jell as the operator. When he moves his arms, the robot moves its arms. When he moves its legs, uh, the, the robot moves its legs. So using that, he's able to use uh, the operator's in, uh, intelligence and coordination. Um, you get that for free, you get to send it to the robot. And this was our way of trying to push our capabilities forward. What was really unique about this project was that in order to have a human teleoperated robot and actually try to push those boundaries, well, uh, we needed some sort of feedback. Like the person needed to know what the robot was feeling. So 
uh, one of the thing, one of the experiments we did um, was uh, to use uh, here uh, the support polygon as an estimator of risk of falling. So we wanted the, the human to be able to control the robot, keep it balanced, and not have a fall. Um, and we did that by saying that uh, if your center of pressure moves outside of your, or get, gets close to your support polygon, um, you're in danger. So what we did is we pushed on the operator to make sure uh, that they would understand that the robot was feeling this. So you can see here in the video, um, I'm pushing on the robot, and then Zhao gets a little bit of a bump away. So I'll play that. I'll play that again, and then you can you can see. Uh, just notice on his hips there. So this worked pretty well. Uh, this concept, <clears throat> and it's because uh, we were doing simple tasks. Um, so something like standing, it's really easy to understand what's risky and what's not. Um, but the moment you decide to take a step, um, you turn a simple task into a more complicated one. So later on, we're doing more fun things like this, um, you know, punching through objects. Or in this case, swinging an axe. And in situations like this, because you have so much different types of contact, maybe you're taking a step, shifting your weight, it's really unclear what you need to do um, in order to quantify the risk of, of situations like this. So let me show you an example of something that's very complicated, a task that's very complicated. Uh, here we have a gymnast on the left. Uh, you can see what she does here on the balance beam. Now that's really amazing save, uh, but what we can understand from that is because the task is so complex and she has such a good understanding of her own capabilities, um, she's able to think about what are the risky situations and risky actions within those capabilities. And um, I can show this again, as she's coming straight over, she realizes that, hey, this I'm probably gonna fall off. So she, she thinks about how do I not fail? Um, by, quant by having some sensation of risk in our own head. Now let's compare that uh, to um, rockets and airplanes. Now these are very complex machines, but for simple tasks like station keeping or flying straight, or just keeping really smooth trajectories, well, we don't really need to explore beyond the boundary of that. Um, whereas tasks on the left, we want to want to be able to explore that full capability on the right. Now for these tasks, if we go beyond that, well, there's really no point because you already accomplished what you want with a simple task. Now it's not just a dichotomy of uh, simple versus uh, more complex. Uh, here we have a spectrum of complexity. So on the left, we see uh, our airplane example, the rocket and uh, a shipping container ship. And we can consider tasks like that uh, to be relatively straightforward. Now, this is not really dependent necessarily on the machines. All these machines can do a wider range of activities. Uh, it's just that for the tasks that we specify, uh, these are more simple. So we compare this, uh, for example, to standing uh, both legs on the ground planted like this. Um, it's relatively simple. So if we're to push the machines a little bit further, then we have examples, say, like the fighter jet. Now, this is starting to look beyond what those standard capabilities are and doing more aggressive maneuvers. Then we have uh, our robots, uh, Cheetah 3 and uh, uh, Mini Cheetah. And with these robots, what we're trying to do is push their ability to address very complex tasks. So for example, something like this, uh, this is a screenshot from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. We we're thinking about the complexities and all that um, uncertainty, unexpectedness that you get from disaster response situations. <laughs> we want to push robots towards that. Now, if we look on the human side, um, uh, we can see that you know running may be uh, very similar to what, what we see in the most aggressive machines. But actually, you know the most aggressive machine of all, I, I would say, is man, right? We, we're always really inspired by the kind of capabilities that athletes are able to pull off. And um, here's an example uh, of that uh, capability and risk trade-off. So, uh, pay attention to the player in white. So you see, he pulls off pulls off some amazing capabilities there. And his understanding is that as we 
have more complex tasks, we need more use of the full capability, and then we need to understand the risk of those states inside of that capability. So in working uh, with robots, um, I've always wanted to build something really cool. And when, I, when you build something cool, you're always saying, well, I don't really want the robot to just follow necessarily a trajectory. Uh, I want it to expand and like, I want it to do the best thing that it can do, or the most aggressive, or you know, the most unexpected movements. And when we start to expand and explore those capabilities, well, we have to start thinking about failure. Because uh, once, once you get past trying to regulate towards something, um, your only goal then is actually, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fall. So the big picture goal for this research is uh, how to quantify risk uh, in a legged robot. Now, if we're able to build these tools, um, then we can maybe get closer to that dream. Uh, we want to allow robots to have more access to creative actions, aggressive movements, uh, all while understanding this risk and trading that off and managing it. So I'd like to briefly go over the contributions of this thesis. Uh, the first is uh, I built a framework uh, to quantify the capability of the robot and also the risk. Uh, we took that uh, methodology and applied it to the analysis for a single leg hopper. And then we're able to use some of those tools, that framework, to again analyze the effectiveness of our quantification. And then finally, uh, we proposed uh, some use of this framework and analysis for uh, slightly related problems. So this is uh, what I'd like to talk about to you today. Um, the first is why do we really care about failure? Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about how to quantify that risk, the methodology. Um, we're going to apply that methodology to a simple example. Uh, and then we're going to use that to examine uh, some slightly related problems. All right, why do we care about risk? Well, this video, I think, really illustrates why. You see a boy running down the hill and now he <laughs> falls. Now, let's watch it again in slow motion and see if you can identify when he looks like he's definitely going to fail. <laughs> so step, 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 step. Okay, right about here. He looked almost okay before, but now he's going to fall for sure. So in really complex tasks, it's not really clear um, how to perform that uh, without falling. Uh, so in this video, what we see is this transition between um, states that are risky but still work, but onto states that fail. So really, we need to understand what these boundaries are, uh, or the boundaries of this capability, so we can understand how uh, risky it is uh, for you to be in that state. Now, this isn't a really new concept. Um, in fact, uh, there's plenty of literature on how people have been trying to quantify risk uh, or safety or capability, these concepts, and they, they can uh, include a meta-stability uh, with uh, the composition controllers. Uh, Tomlin did some reachability analysis, so it's like if the fail is in your, you can, you can get there, that's a failure. Um, we have people who have done exhaustive trajectory optimization to find what these spaces are. And also there's some concepts of periodicity, and finally some state-based concepts for more simple applications on uh, ZMP and tumble stability. Now, with these, uh, a lot of these uh, methods are looking for guarantees of stability or guarantees of safety. And that's where they're, they're focused on relatively simple tasks. But for very complex tasks, none of these identify essentially the full space and the likelihood of failure within that. So they can't necessarily tell you everything you can do and give you a quality of those actions that you can do. So this is how we think uh, about this. Uh, so in, in this example uh, of how to address the boy falling while running down the hill, um, we can build this framework um, that's also known as, uh, that's adaptive a bit from viability theory. Uh, so suppose we start out in some safe states. So I, I call them home states because uh, that's where you're most comfortable with. These are states that you have to start out in. Uh, you do something and then maybe you should be, be back in those states. Now this big uh, blue area, this is if you were to run every possible, poss anything you can do, all the possibilities, this would be called the reachable space. So this is all the states that you could possibly see or get to. 
And inside of that um, are terminating states um, right here. Now, this is analogous to uh, the boy, um, kind of, he's, he's on, he's sprawled on the ground there. And those are states that you really don't want. They're so undesirable, you really don't want to get to those. But what we notice in many systems is that there are a lot of states uh, like these that no matter what you do, they're going to lead uh, to some failure. You might still be continuing in your process. The robot might still be working and moving, but it's going to reach one of these guaranteed failures. And that's what's uh, known in viability theory as non-viable states. So these are states that are inevitably going to fail. So everything else in there is known as the viable states. So these are states that can continue to work. It's no guarantee that they won't fail, but there is a guarantee that if you um, apply the right controls, you can stay within that boundary. And that's analogous uh, for us uh, at, um, to capability. So we can think of the robot's capability as all the things it can do without um, guaranteed failure. So that's a lot of states uh, and tons and tons of data uh, that we need to think through. So the way that we approach this problem is through a discrete network representation. So in this concept, um, we're essentially trying to find links between states. So if you have a state, um, you want to link it to another one, we can build this network of connections. And then we can use that uh, to analyze uh, how risky uh, states really are by how likely they are to go into any of these failure states that we mentioned before. So in order to build this, um, we're going to need a few concepts. Uh, so the first uh, is the graph node. So this is one possible state of the robot. Uh, the second is the action or the graph edge. So in this case, this is the, this connects two states. So if you apply that action at your starting state, which is a node, um, you'll get to another node, which is another state. So now we'll get into the more uh, user-defined uh, aspect of this. And failure is, we, we need to, it's user-defined. So we need to figure out what's really undesirable for our robot or our system. And then we can define that. Uh, the starting states, uh, these are some very stable states. So if you're really comfortable in these states, this is where you start the entire exploration. Uh, we have home states, and these are some states that we know are so comfortable in going and regulating these states that they'll go towards the starting states. Uh, so you can consider uh, the starting and home to be uh, similar. And then finally, uh, we have this all-encompassing idea of the behavior class, which is that uh, in a robot, uh, a lot of its capability is defined by its hardware. It's intrinsic to its hardware, but we don't really know what that is. Uh, so these are all the other choices uh, that kind of constrain this problem uh, that aren't related to the hard to changing the hardware. Now, if we were to build a map like that or a, a graph like that, it's still have tons and tons of data. So uh, what we need to do is simplify this further. Uh, so in this example on the left, um, we want to run a model on a humanoid, but you can see that a humanoid actually, uh, with all of its complexity, uh, all those joints, arms, um, legs, it kind of acts like a single leg hopping robot. So what we use for this thesis then uh, is uh, this model here, uh, which I call the, the pogo stick robot or the pogo bot. It has uh, two degrees of freedom on uh, theta and L, and it can apply a thrust force either on the leg or it can apply a torque on a body through a flywheel. So this is the model that we're going to be using throughout this thesis presentation. Now to compress this even further or think about how we can manage this, um, we use ideas of hybrid transitions. So for those who aren't familiar, you can think about robots at some, this hopping robot at some point is going to be in a single contact dynamics uh, so it means that the robot's on the ground and it's touching the ground, applying some force. And then there's also another uh, portion of its uh, behavior where it's in the air. Those are the flight dynamics. And any robot that's hopping is going to go between those two. So you would you essentially, if you were to look at the state, would do something like that. Now what we do is we place uh, our, we record all of our data uh, when it reaches these boundaries. And the reason why we do that is that unless you fail, you're going and you have to be going through these boundaries continuously in order to keep working. So for the, the robot, it's actually 
more complicated than just that. Um, you actually have all these different uh, events that happen. And uh, you, let's say you started out um, by standing. And uh, if you were to apply some forces, you might go to pre-takeoff, which is right when you're about to lift off the ground, um, which transitions then into this post-takeoff event, which is uh, right, it's right when it started going into the air. And then uh, you might come down again, and that, that goes into this pre-impact, which is right, right before it starts putting force on the ground, post-impact. And then from there, once you're on the ground, there's a possibility for you to go to a home state, because in this case, I defined it as the robot uh, standing straight up. Now, this um, any cycle of these states is going to imply that the robot's continually not failing. But you can fail from many of these states. Uh, for us, we take the, I use pre-takeoff states, um, which have some distinct advantages. So if you're to think towards hardware or take those considerations, um, the very end of ground contact is probably when your estimation of state is the best. So uh, keeping an eye towards that, um, we've selected pre-takeoff as the type of uh, nodes in our graph. Another side effect of this is that at that state, uh, there's actually only three states. So there's a theta, theta dot, and L dot. Uh, since there's only three, three states, uh, it's actually a little bit easier to plot and visualize, which has been a really great help for this project. So now that we've decided on pre-takeoff states, well, uh, we're going to discretize the space. So what we do is uh, we look at the three variables, the, the theta, the theta dot, and the L dot. We cut uh, each of those. Uh, we set limits, and then we cut them into 501 uh, discretizations. So how do we run actions then? Well, at um, every takeoff, what we do is we say that the robot is going to apply some sort of controller that gets it um, to landing. And then from there, there's no controller. After that, it's random uh, sampling from this set of cap uh, capabilities. So on the x-axis, we have the torque that can be applied to the robot. On the y-axis is the force, thrust force that's applied on the leg. And when it's on the ground, it applies these square profiles on the ground with any combination of these. So in summary, um, we have to set up this exploration. So we define uh, a couple of states. So failure for us is when the body touches the ground. Um, the starting states are when the robot's standing upright. And then the home states are this small region around the starting state. So imagine uh, if the robot landed, and it was moving very, very slowly, but it was mostly upright. We call that a home state. And those for us are exceptional. We consider those um, to be very, very safe. Uh, in our gridding, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we set some limits and cut them into 501 discretizations for access. Um, the rules uh, for the robot on the ground are to apply these uh, force and torque profiles. And then when it's in the air, it tries to land in the configuration that's close to the capture point. For those who are familiar with that. So how does this look like? Well, this is one example of, say, a takeoff, a pre-takeoff state. So the leg has reached its maximum extension. It's about to fly into the air. And we're going to try to sample all of our actions. So what we do, um, we apply everything uh, in the range of our torques and forces uh, that we, we intended to sample. So it looks something like this. So in here, all the red states are states that it failed before taking off again. All the green states are those where it took off and then landed and could take off again. Now, one thing to note is that the red states, when you look at them, you know that it's dangerous. Like that control applied or that, that particular action applied to that particular state was going to result in the robot failing. Uh, but the, if you look at the green states, it doesn't mean that the robot's not going to fail eventually. So if you remember that multi-step falling, uh, this, this could be on the way to that. Uh, while doing this, we also additionally look at whether or not the robot reaches a home state. So if it lands and then almost reaches vertical uh, slowly, it, it has um, a possibility of going there as well. So doing this over and over, we take the reachable space of the robot, and then we apply all these sample time, we sample all these actions, and then build up a network. So what do we do with that network? Well, we need to propagate some idea of which uh, states actually fail and which states succeed. Uh, there's plenty of states that fail immediately, 
or plenty of states that immediately can go to a home state. So we know those are good. But what about everybody else? Uh, so for the safe states, um, what we do is if anything after, if you, if you have a state and you can reach that home state, then you're also safe. So we do this in a backwards way where we look at all the things that we're able to reach the home states first and then uh, see what the whole set is. So similarly, we can say uh, the failure states are also are propagated backwards like this. So we look at all the states that immediately fail, and then we kind of step back and say, what were the states that led to those, and um, so on and so forth until uh, we reach the end of that. So what does this look like? Uh, in this graph, uh, I'm showing this is in the pre-takeoff space. So the robot um, coordinates uh, are the theta, which is the angle, the theta dot, which is the angle rate, and then L dot, which is how, how fast the leg is extending. And here, these states that I've shown in maroon, this only takes one takeoff uh, before it can reach a home state, a very safe home state. So as it's taking off, it's going to reach the home state on the next step. And uh, similarly, you can say in two takeoffs, three, four, all the way to seven, there are some that need that many takeoffs in order to reach uh, the home state. So you can see as it's building up here how many, how far you could possibly be from having a pop, uh, being able to stop in a home state. So similarly, we can look at what happens for the failure states. Um, there are some states right here, uh, in one takeoff, no matter what, you are going to fail. Uh, there's some that uh, maybe you can't actually see that failure until later. So we can see that being built up here. So you have one step. Uh, these will fail in two, three, four, five, and I think there's a few in six, which you can't see very well. So what is the idea of many steps before failure, many takeoffs? Well, if you're six in, in this group here with five or six, it means that um, you can keep hopping for that many steps before you have to fall on the ground. So if we look at our video again here, um, we see, you know, once he has crossed that boundary where we know that he's gonna fail, he still had a couple of steps in him, and that's the idea that we're um, seeing here. All right, so once we've propagated all this uh, viable and non-viable, so the guaranteed failures versus the working states, uh, we have a space that looks like this. Um, on the, we have theta, which is the angle theta dot, the angle rate, and the L dot here, which is the, uh, the, the extension uh, speed of the robot. And I've labeled three points here, which you can see um, different robot configurations and states. Now this is a very complicated shape. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that we see very, a large variation in types of states that are all viable. So these are all states that can work. Now that we have this, um, how do we turn this into the quantity of risk, which is what we're truly after? Well, we're, we want to take this network and turn it into some probability of failure from every state. So my philosophy, uh, I think looking at probability of failure within this capability you know, has some distinct advantages over uh, perhaps uh, some more traditional ideas of a Cartesian distance. So in that one, you would look at maybe how similar a state is to uh, a failing state, and then make a determination on that uh, for how dangerous something is. And then there, uh, you have some difficulties with like what is the right projection, what are the right coordinate systems in order to make that work. So I think uh, probability is actually a much more straightforward way of thinking about this. So how do we do this probability projection? Well, we start with the most a uh, simple example, this is a classic example, it's called a drunkard's walk, and it's an implementation of what's called an absorbing markup chain. In the drunkard's walk, so you assume there's a drunk that's stumbling in the middle of the road, and with some probability with each step, he might either go left or he might go right. And if he makes it all the way to the right, uh, he's going to end up at the pub. And once he's at the pub, because he's a drunk, he's going to stay there. 
And then if he goes home, uh, because he's already drunk, he's going to stay there and sleep. Uh, so how, th this problem gives us a nice framework for how to project uh, using our network um, the probabilities of reaching either home states or failure. Uh, so we can see here uh, the stumbling on the road we could assume is kind of like our transient space, which I've called here. Um, that don't directly lead you to home or lead you to failure. And then the pub, of course, is the failure states, and then the home states, well, the home states. Now, how we do this is we run random walks on our network that we built in order to find these probabilities. And the nice thing about that is it's completely controller agnostic. We're not really looking at, we're not trying to find any controllers. We're actually just trying to quantify the quality of all these states and doing that by not biasing it towards any particular behavior. <laughs> so after we run this computation and we're able to take every state and assign some sort of probability to it uh, of reaching home or reaching the failure states, uh, we get something that looks like this. Um, this is the, all those states that we said that worked on uh, the viable set now labeled um, in color uh, corresponding to the likelihood or the probability using this random walk, that they will end up at a home state, which is the safest state. So you can see here in the blue, um, this is plotted on a log scale. So in, in the blue, these are very, very safe. So using random controls, if you're somewhere around here, uh, which is just the robot essentially doing this up and down, there's a one in 10 chance that just your, your random walk is going to allow you to stop safely. Um, now, in, Contrast, you have some very dangerous ones. Uh, these have very low safety value, and you can see some plotted maybe over here. And that's something like there's one in 10 to the 10 chance uh, that this random walk will take you to a very safe home state. So we can see this uh, overall. And yeah, that's just amazingly complex. Um, what we can do then is uh, plot also all the states that don't work. So remember earlier, we separated um, that network of explorations that we had into the states that were viable, so those are the good ones, and then the states that were non-viable, so everything that's guaranteed to fail. So in this surrounding area, in the pink, uh, that's, those are all the states that are non-viable. And you can see there's actually some boundaries here. So, uh, for instance, uh, right over here, um, these, these states don't actually have any uh, boundary with failing states. So we can think of those as uh, reachability boundary. So maybe if the, the motors were stronger, um, you might be able to push that out a little bit. Uh, the other boundary we see is the one that actually borders uh, in Cartesian space, um, the failing states. And, and those seem to have a little bit lower safety values. Let me give you an example of what this really means. So we have all these numbers here, and they're, uh, some of them are quite extreme. Like you have you know, 10 to the power of, of 0, and then 1 and 10 to the 10. Um, so we can look at a state that, that's maybe red here. And I'll show you what that means in real life. So, <coughs> we can watch someone trying to shovel their driveway. <laughs> 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 the miraculous thing is that he made it. <laughs> but the idea here is that because we're using this random walk, it essentially counts the number of control sequences that allow you to reach a home state. So in this case, maybe you won the lottery. There's maybe only one way you can survive that, and then you did. Uh, so that's what un very, very unsafe uh, safety would mean. Uh, for very high ones, you can imagine multiple paths, a lot of redundancy. So you could essentially choose to do any action and then also um, reach uh, some sort of safe state. Now that we have all this data on the, the Pogo state robot, uh, I'd like to examine it a little bit further. Um, in this, we defined an idea of Cartesian distance, um, which is uh, how typically you might want to think about uh, being close to danger, close to failure. So in this case, since we gridded up our space of takeoffs, we looked at where uh, in that grid um, there was a failing state 
and close to it in Cartesian space uh, was uh, one of those working states or non-viable states. So we plotted then the safety value um, here on the y-axis against that distance here on the x-axis. Uh, so what we can see from this is that there's two, two conclusions. First is that it's pretty intuitive. If you get farther away, the safety value that we've generated is actually higher. So the intuitive thing is, of course, you know, if you're on a ledge or something, um, the farther back you are, the better you'll feel about it. Um, but that's just the lower bound. The converse of that isn't true. So if you're very, very close, in the sense that um, in that gridded space that I have, and uh, in Cartesian distance, your, your working, your viable state was very, very close, or just neighboring a, a guaranteed failure, that doesn't actually mean that you're going to fail. Um, using the kind of projection that I've done with my metric. So the intuition behind that, though, is like if you're on a ledge, maybe you're not always that scared if, if you happen to be going one way or the other. Uh, might be more dangerous in certain situations than others. Um, the interesting fact is that um, when, we, when we make these assumptions about this distance, uh, like we did in the Hermes project, uh, where we wanted we use potential wells to say keep away from these boundaries, keep away from these failure boundaries because you're getting close. Well, actually, that was the most conservative interpretation of uh, data that we have here. So now that we've looked at it further, let's make some conservative assumptions. Um, we plotted uh, here the Cartesian distance and uh, the safety value. So suppose we decided to take away states that we thought weren't very, very, weren't very safe. And we thought we wanted to do that because they were close um, to non-working states. Uh, we would use this vertical rectangle and essentially just take all the states away from the left on uh, going towards the right. Uh, we could also make a different assumption and say, well, the safety value that we generated in these risk maps, well, some of we shouldn't go to the ones that are very low because they're very hard to achieve. Um, so in that case, we, we take away from the bottom here. So let me show you an example of what I mean. Um, here, I've decided that uh, all states that are within a distance of four um, in, Cartesian, in that Cartesian bin space to the closest failing state um, are going to be removed. So what we've done, we've gone through all the viable portion of this space, and then uh, we've essentially expanded balls around it to find the when it first touches a non-working state. And then we come up with this set. So you can see it's actually just a very thin uh, layer uh, almost uh, on, on the big space that I showed you earlier. The thing is though, if you just take away this, uh, you don't actually, this isn't the only effect it has on what you can do. Since we're looking at the full capability of the robot, I want to examine how does that actually affect the capability. And a good intuitive idea is like this. Suppose um, these are all the states that we're in, the blue dots, and the arrows represent these links, these actions that we took to get to each of these states. Now suppose um, we decided that we were going to remove one of them because we didn't like it, uh, because you know, it didn't satisfy the criterion of risk that we decided on. Well, what happens is that now, well, the previous state um, is bad too, because uh, you can't, if you, if you go here, then you're going to lead to something that you assume is going to fail. And then you can't reach some states subsequently because your only path to them was through what you thought uh, were some dangerous states. So let's see that played out uh, for the example I showed earlier. Um, here we have plotted in the red all the states that you removed because you thought they were dangerous. Um, in black were the states that become now dangerous because you removed, you, you assumed the red ones were extremely dangerous. And then the green ones because you can't reach them because uh, your only path was through something that you didn't like. And we can actually see a massive amplification in what you uh, lose in capability. So before you might have thought, I was going to be conservative by not going to any of those red states. But actually what happens, you can't go to any of those black states and you can't go to any of those green states. 
So this is just one example, uh, and to make sure it wasn't a fluke, um, we, we tried it for um, many different uh, sets. So in the blue here, um, uh, the A1 uh, to A8, these correspond to removing all the states by how close in Cartesian distance they are to a failing state. Uh, so here we moved all the states that are within the distance one, and over here distance eight. And uh, in, this, in the red line, what we did is try to remove a similar number of states, but use a different method. So take all take the safety value that we generated from our risk quantification, and then uh, remove about the same number and see what happens. So in this graph, the x-axis, this is the normalized amount of removed states. So this is the proportion of your capability that you lost from your conservative assumption. On the y-axis, this is the portion of your states that are actually affected, um, including the ones that you removed uh, from your full capability. And this yellow line here represents uh, the idea that if you just remove some states you can't, and you can't get to them, those were the only affected states. So you can see, no matter what we do, um, we're going to lose some additional capability. So it's going to it's smart to think about what the assumptions are uh, for your robot and how um, danger actually plays into that because you, you have a potential to lose quite a bit. So now that we had uh, analyzed the, the data from the pogo stick robot, um, we'd like to do something with all those quantified risk values that we got. Um, now remember, there wasn't any control that was associated with like making those values, uh, but we can use them for control, and it's going to be pretty useful uh, as I showed here. Uh, suppose we want to define, des design a simple risk aware controller. So, in here, we wanted to follow some trajectory uh, shown in red. Um, this is uh, some velocity trajectory, so we want the robot to maybe at every takeoff, you know, have some forward speed. And then we set a threshold of how tolerant we are of risk. So on the left side, this is very, very intolerant of risk. So I, we say that the worst state you can be in, that value has a one in 10 chance using the random walk of reaching something safe. And as you can see, nothing really happens. The robot is essentially doesn't follow the trajectory at all, even though it conforms to the risk value. So what's the robot doing? It's saying, I want to go forward, can't do it. It's too dangerous, so I just keep doing this. Yeah over and over and over again. So on the right, uh, we make this a lot more uh, risk tolerant. We say that the worst possible state that you can go to uh, from our methodology has a one in 10 to the 10 chance of reaching a safe home state. So this is almost everything. We're allowing the robot to do whatever it wants uh, within the capability. So long, you know, it doesn't, it can't fail, of course. So we can again see this red trajectory, which is um, what we have a desire. And the robot essentially just bounces around that and gets it kind of starts uh, moving in that direction. So you can assume it's kind of moving along like that. And here we can see that the robot is not uh, constrained by any uh, of this, this uh, risk ideas that we have. So similarly, instead of using this as a constraint, we can, because we have a quantity, we can actually control now on that quantity. So let's say we wanted from always go to the state with the lowest risk next. And you can see here that this robot will hop, uh, make seven hops, and essentially increase uh, its safety value every single hop. But when you look on the states, there's really not a good idea of what it's doing. It's kind of hopping back and forth. But uh, those states are actually considered safe by probability of failure. So I've shown a little bit in control. Um, now that we have this quantity, we can also make targets about this in design. Uh, so I propose um, this idea where you can think of that nominal robot that I showed earlier in the talk, and then let's make some modifications to it. Let's say we cut out 20% of the mass. Yeah. And in this column, you can see a that we added a certain amount of capability and then we lost some compared to the nominal. So we can repeat this process um, um, by taking away inertia, maybe doing some combination of mass and inertia, and then we can try to understand what are the effects of these slight parameter variations. 
And one thing that I propose uh, that I think is a little bit more useful um, than that is when you're designing a robot, um, sometimes what you do is you'll, you'll make some target parameter assumption. We're just going to make the robot you know, have, have these fixed parameters, and you build it. And it's not really the same. Or you know, maybe the battery isn't, isn't big enough. You add a battery, now your mass is higher. Well, what can you do? Um, we can think of an idea of maybe like a design robust set of capabilities. So these are essentially the intersections of all the different variations we have. So you know that when you build this robot, um, if you if you even make a slight change, you're not going to, you're not going to lose, uh, you're not going to have less capability than this. So now to summarize, um, this whole process that I did uh, started with uh, looking at the Pogo stick robot, um, talking about the ideas of risk, failure, quantifying, how to quantify those risks inside of the act, inside of the states that you could do. And then from there we produced the space of states that the robot could be safe in. And beyond that, we've now labeled this comparative quality of states. So now we can say certain states that you can achieve are better or worse than others. And from that quantity, uh, we have several possibilities. We can be, begin to take this uh, quantity and use it to inform controls. We can use it to form design, cost, functions, or uh, look at how to make constraints. So looking forward from this work, um, what we've done is run this on a kind of single leg hopper. We want to push this towards more complex machines. So things like the humanoids and the quadrupeds. Uh, we looked at one possibility of defining a risk metric. Uh, we have using a random walk, uh, but there are other types of assumptions that you can make. So we like to look at how we can blend those in and see what are the best ways for your robot. Uh, because as we showed earlier, um, if you make some bad assumptions about how you want to be conservative due to that risk, uh, there are some real implications to that. And the, the final um, kind of obvious direction uh, from here is this is another data set that we can use to inform machine intelligence. Uh, maybe we can improve the performance of uh, artificial intelligence uh, learning machines. So with that, um, I'd like to reflect a little bit uh, on my time here at MIT. Um, and uh, show a couple of uh, funny moments. Uh, I, I think I pulled up this picture a few days ago, and this was Cheetah One. Um, and you'll notice that the dork behind there is wearing a helmet. Uh, that that is me. Uh, <laughs> at the time, we had a we had a very very powerful what we thought was an explosion, but it turned out to actually be the, the robot motors being incredibly powerful. Uh, and we really didn't know how dangerous these things were, so we took every precaution. So we taped up a couple of plastic boxes in front of the, the guy who's trying to lower the robot. We had to wear a helmet at that time. I think we're much more cavalier these days. Um, uh, there's a, we have Cheetah 2, and there's a tiny one to Dubai. And uh, this is kind of my favorite one, where um, I think at the beginning of the Hermes project, uh, we decided to kick trash cans. <laughs> 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 you have to give commitment to the, 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 the cameraman, it was John. <laughs> uh, that I have so many people I need to thank. Uh, there, are so, there are many people that are involved in this project. Um, uh, there's too many here to list, but uh, I think in particular I'd like to acknowledge uh, a Lauren uh, from Lincoln Lab who provided a supercomputer access. Uh, for me and really greatly accelerated uh, my results, as well as saved Sangbei tons of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, several of you are off, some of you are in the audience, uh, who I've really enjoyed mentioning. It's been really great to see you grow. Uh, on the Hermes project, uh, Zhao, of course, uh, partner in crime, and, and then uh, all the others who really assisted in uh, helping us build out that concept, uh, take it to Dubai, and really market it. Uh, and try to win that million bucks that we were doing. Uh, I have so many other colleagues I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, uh, I think Sang, uh, Sook, and Haywon Park were really great mentors to me, uh, in addition to Patrick, who uh, helped uh, with this project. And then uh, I'd also like to thank my thesis committee members, um, Neville Hogan, um, Alberto Rodriguez, and Scott Kramerzma, 
uh, who have challenged me so much uh, in, this, in this process. And uh, finally, my advisor, uh, who's been challenging me for the last 10 years or so. It's <laughs> 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 really expanded my mind, actually. And I thank you, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, finally, uh, I have so many friends uh, who've been supporting me throughout this process, and also my family, you know, my parents in the back. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, be happy to take any questions. Any questions for audience? Yeah, Joe. Well, this might be a very like, detailed part of the, the sure. work. Uh, I was just became curious about um, the like, the regions or the states, mm -hmm. the areas or the volumes. I guess them might be sensitive to the great size it take for the action actuator actions in the states and even the kind of strategy. How sensitive those are? Um, yeah. So I, I've just begun to explore this idea. So um, you could say in some ways I've gotten lucky. I, I, I've been able to find some set of parameters and grading that, that allow me to produce some volume. Um, the best I can give you for this answer right now uh, is that we know, uh, I know for sure that um, what the, the settings that I have, if I change um, the, the action resolution by about 10 times, you actually get about the same volume. Um, so I found, in, in some sense, an upper bound of what the knowledge you can gain from your computation is. And I, I think uh, maybe leading to your, um, maybe some future thought for you is to think about how you can lower that requirement, still come up with similar insights. Albert, can you repeat the questions that you get? Oh, sure. Uh, so Jomu asked, uh, what was the sensitivity of these, uh, these networks, the volumes I've plotted, um, to grid size, the resolution of the action space, and um, okay. how we set up the problem, essentially. And uh, did, were you able to hear the answer to that? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, the question that yeah. How did you choose um, for the simulation the size of the components of the uh, Pogo robot? Were they just similar to like human dimensions, or mm. the way the design is? It's just from oh yes. Uh, the question there was how did you choose the the size and dimensions uh, for the nominal uh, model that I run for the Pogo bot? Um, so the answer to that is is really just from intuition. You design enough things, you get a sense of. Um, of how big things are. Uh, one one detail that I didn't mention in this presentation was that a lot of the mass parameters that I use uh, use more kind of dummy parameters, you could say, like kilo or two kilo, something like that. Um, whereas when you're really detailed designing it, you would have much more um, uh, like finer control over those. So in, in order to say like how you want to move that model over. Um, to the real thing, uh, I think the, the last proposal I did in design that would be very helpful. Uh, yes. Um, so the region that you had, the three D regions, uh, these were I mean, pre-flight, like the pre-take a step yep. situations. Um, so some of the region would then be associated with, I guess, moving forward. Some of the region would be associated with moving backward. Mm -hmm. I guess that's right. But then, potentially, it means in order to pass from moving forward to moving back, we need to pass through a region in the middle of that. Uh, when we apply the conservative, you know, four, four, you know, units away, mm -hmm. that space is empty. Mm. So what's interesting about this is oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually heard that one. So you're oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> a long question. So. <laughs> so did you find that it was able to maybe switch? Did you observe sometimes where it started moving forward and then ran and walked backwards uh, successfully? Absolutely. So what, what we see, let me let me go back to one of those. Uh, you can see it here. Um, this is actually a Poincaré section. And so it, we define this Poincaré section as the robot land. It's right about to lift off. Okay, what's the state there? 
So you can think that there's so many things that can happen in between. Uh, suppose you suck your leg out or you ram a huge door, you could go like this and then take off again. So there's no need to essentially um, get closer and closer and closer. So that that's more of the idea of uh, what I would call like regulating the state. Right? It's like you, you have some regulation where you're kind of bringing this closer and closer to the desired maybe like zero velocity. Um, whereas in here, since you're looking at the takeoff all the way to the next takeoff, there's possibility for you to be able to jump around this map. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it seems then the Cartesian distance in units of this space, mm -hmm. it's almost the amount of control effort you need to apply during the five days to get to that next spot. Mm. That's, that's what it seems like. Uh, you, you could think about it that way. Yeah, it's like if you were to move very far in there, uh, I would assume that there, there's a large amount of energy associated with it. Um, uh, although I didn't test that assumption. I guess so. Um, so you should uh, exactly where you regulate the risk with some sort of optimization. Uh, you talk? I, don't know, I think it's maybe the yeah, app this one. Um, I guess what what are the kinds of tasks that a controller such as this would be used for? I'm imagining like just a projection to get back to a to a nominal risk. Um, could you talk about the tasks that this would be used for? Yeah, so I, I'm thinking a little bit more in terms of humans because I've watched so many of these. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did, were you able to hear the question? Uh, only partially. Oh, okay. Um, so Philip asked uh, how. Um, optimization controller here that operates on uh, the risk quantity uh, as a control variable uh, would have applications for. All right, so to answer your question, uh, I, I think of this as kind of some emergency controller idea. So remember that gymnast um, who was, who was like almost going to fall off the balance beam. Uh, she decides maybe at one point, I'm going to give up on what I was doing. And I'm just going to try to minimize that risk. So this would this would be like the fastest way to get up. Um, I think there are other applications. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, there's some disturbance rejection ideas, uh, but they don't really play too far into the kind of the way that I defined uh, the risk quantity. As I said, it was a random walk on all the actions that you can choose. Um, so this is sort of like how good you can you can execute uh, on, on a certain um, uh, state to, to drive you towards um, something safe. That answer your question. I hope. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, can I ask a follow up question? Of course. So um, the optimization that's sort of, I think it's on the next slide uh, that you're doing for control, what it's sort of saying is um, I want to do a sort of minimization of the action over this current time step mm -hmm. with respect to a constraint that. You know, it's a probability defined on the assumption that I act uniformly randomly afterward. Yeah. But then in the next time step, you actually run this optimization again. So it's, it's almost like that that risk metric doesn't quite correspond to the right policy. Um, so I don't know if you have thoughts about, like, you know, more generally, if you were going to use this for control design, that you would compute, you know, probability measures that were with respect to a particular policy that you're actually going to execute. Yeah, that's uh, something that we've thought about a lot. Um, and the reason why we arrived at this random walk idea was that we really didn't want to bias it towards any, any sort of policy. Because one, once you do that, and then if I were to take that set and run this controller again, um, I would essentially be bound to do whatever that initial policy uh, had already set for me. Uh, and I, I would think that that essentially covers the whole space when it really in actual doesn't. Now, to your point, though, um, we could think about relabeling um, the probabilities of transition between these states. Since we have that whole network, and we can relabel all the edge weights um, uh, to consider uh, the types of uh, policies that you're, you're talking about. And there's very possible that uh, you know we might reduce that space, um, but the, the safety in, in those uh, areas, I mean, it has to be higher, I think. I guess it wouldn't have to be higher. You could also have a policy if it was just arbitrarily bad. Yeah. <laughs> Always ran towards failures. But yeah. 
show you really good. Our adversarial controller. <laughs> Two, three, four, five. Thank you so much. Um, just in case you pass, uh, can you tell where? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. Uh, uh, the, the conference room. Five five zero two. Uh, zero. Five zero zero two zero is in, across the Kinan Court base, uh, basement at two. Two. Uh, that can be so a little bit We're gonna have a only uh, meeting with the committee members only, so please. Uh, the room the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>